Hello and welcome to our round four weekly review show for the 2024 Guinness Men's Six Aces Championship here on the KLNS Rugby Podcast. After a penultimate weekend divided by agony and ecstasy, and that's just on Saturday, we will try and pre- try and piece together where the teams went right and went wrong. Join, rejoin us tonight, we have two returnees, one of which is an imp- late impact sub, a bomb squad specialist, if you will, in the form of David Cordial. And of course, our favourite Welsh guest in Yeston Thomas, who is back as well. Our favourite Ospreys fan, I should have said, not Welsh guest, because they'll kill the rest of them will kill me. But <laughs> welcome back, lads. Good to have you back on. Thanks, Ian. Right. Thank you very much. I'll happily take the uh, tag of uh, best Welsh guest. I'll um and and to all Welsh journalists and everyone surrounding, happy wooden spoon week as well. <laughs> Starting the optimism off on a great start there. <laughs> yes. But we will start in Twickenham, unfortunately, which is where the optimism dies once some more. Just like all times, a Grand Slam favourite denied in a matchup between Ireland and England, but this time it doesn't feel as good because it was Marcus Smith and England who dropped Ireland to a defeat 23-22 in Twickenham. A gut-wrenching classic, it should be said. But David, it's not to be consecutive slams for Ireland after England kind of resolutely cut them down. Just get the ball rolling here. What's your thoughts on, on this defeat for Ireland? Um, I think, God, it was tough. It was really tough. I appreciate you taking taking advantage of my mas- masochism to get me on for this one. But uh, I mean, look, at the end of the day, slams are hard. Back-to-back slams are, are even harder. So um, I think we were, some of us, myself basically, was was a bit uh, a bit putting the cart before the horse in, in expecting uh, things to pan out uh, smoothly. Um, I think the biggest thing after that match for Ireland is that uh, in terms of the fairness of the result, we can have no complaints. I think Andy Farrell said afterwards that it would have been unjust if Ireland had won it. Uh, we really didn't deserve it. It was a mixture of England playing possibly their best game. I think some of the pundits over there were saying since 2019. And Ireland just having a, a complete off day where it seemed like nothing went our way. We just it, it was almost unrecognisable from the team of the first three rounds. Um, I think I said in the preview that for England to win, they would need to prevent us from playing the way we wanted to play. And that's pretty much exactly what they did. And they targeted the line out, they targeted our rooks to slow down our speed. And they did something that basically anytime it's been deployed against Ireland teams, it has worked in that they deployed a vicious blitz defense. Um, I think particularly in that first 20 minutes, the ferocity, even through the television of the English uh, defense was just something to behold. And, And it meant that Ireland were never able to get a grip on the game. Um, we fought back, you know, it has to be said, we only lost by a point in the end. We scored two lovely tries through James Lowe and and the game was in the balance. But I think at the end of the day, uh, with two penalty advantages and a drop goal right in front, that was uh, that was about as, as fair a result as, as we were going to get out of that fixture. Yeah, unfortunately, that there is that element. And I've been criticised a few times for being overly harsh in this Irish team. And I don't think it's that. Like, sorry, I'm not saying, well, I'm right and you're wrong. It's not that everyone's entitled to their own opinion on it, but there is a sense of disappointment in this game and disappointed in the players more than in the result, in the fact that, like, this had so many replicable moments to the quarterfinal. Yeah. And you are left thinking, lads, you have to start learning. And, like, this isn't, like, just kick them when they're down, because I do believe they'll beat Scotland. I do believe they'll win championship. And I will enjoy it, and I'm I'm hoping to, to get to go. I'm waiting on the, hopefully getting a ticket, and I I'd, I'd love to be there. But you do feel like lads, you've you've let a huge opportunity slip in the same way you did in the quarterfinal. And like I know people will say, well, you can't be a great team if you don't get to a semi final or or blah blah blah. It just feels like this was your chance to to make history, which Andy Farrell is all about. We we know that he'll he'll praise England. He'll be the bigger man. Peter Mahoney will talk, conduct himself very well in the interview, but. For Omani, Tyke Byrne, Tyke Furlong, Caelan Doris, um, you know, I'm I'm trying to think to someone else, James Lowe, like these lads are world class players who haven't mixed tournaments amongst them, but just didn't leave a huge impact on the game, and that's yeah. the disappointing part because you you can't die wondering, you know, and to their credit, as he said, they fought back, they fought back gallantly, they they it was there for them. I think if I think it's a weird one. I think if like we get a proper hold on was it Furbank at that last carry that they made huge guards and we hold them up, that's it. It's over. Yeah. But I but just, that's what, but the second failure of also makes that break 
yeah. it also felt like it was over the other side as well. Yeah, a, a real failure on the night. And this is something that, that I've seen teams, um, I've seen Connacht teams in the past, I've seen Italian teams in the past um, slip up on this. And it's something that really kills you. We really struggle with our exits. We really struggle to get out of our own half cleanly. And that's something we're usually so good at, particularly through James Lowe. But I thought Murray Kinsler made a good point on, um, I think it was Ben Earl getting to to James Lowe in that he knew he knew Gibson Park was going to fend. He knew he wasn't going to pass. He knew he wasn't going to kick himself. He was going to pass it to Lowe. And Earl set himself uh, as a sprinter and just pelted that low um, to to you know, not block him down, but but disrupt his his kicking. It seemed like this England team, to their credit, knew exactly the way Ireland were going to play and and built a game plan to neutralize each of those strengths at source and um you know i mean in that way it's it's a testament to this ireland team that they that they warranted that level of analysis and that level of of counter programming um i think it's also maybe not not a, a stretch to say when you looked at at all black teams of the past for you to beat them they had to have a bad day and you had to have a really good day and i think if we want to take any positives out of this it's that it took a, a, england having a very good day and ireland having a bad one for england to get a one point win in twickenham this is still a very good Ireland team. And, and I agree with you. I do think they will beat Scotland partially because it's at home, partially because we've had their measure for the last few years. But I think partially because these guys are not going to take this line down. They're not going to do this two weeks in a row. I would expect Andy Farrell um, to, to stick largely with the same team, possibly with a few changes due to injuries. But um, I think it's going to be a, it'll be a great game because it'll be a Scotland uh, hunting for a first triple crown, crown in, in quite some time. And and Ireland not only looking for a championship, but looking for, sorry, looking for a redemption for for what was going to be a day that that they will remember for a long time as a as a massive missed opportunity. That's, I I think you've summed it up wonderfully there. Like there's, and there is layers to it, and it's not finger pointing, and it's not just giving out for the sake of giving out, type of you know, negative chat just for the sake of negativity. They will be disappointed, but they will have to be hard on themselves. I think I think they kind of have to be insofar as you look at, okay, some of the pre-match talk was too far, but we did kind of all have the consensus that Ireland would have to play down um, if they were to lose this game. And I did make the point on the preview podcast that a lot of our conversation was similar to the quarterfinal where, okay, if Ireland gets stopped, they're still going to have to not play as well. There, it's going to come from not finding a way out. And it is kind of the old phrase of everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. Ireland had a plan until England shut them down at source. They put Gibson Park under pressure. Like, fair enough, um, Ben Earl shooting out the line to try and charge down James Lowe. Some of the passes back to James Lowe weren't perfect. Joe McCarthy made four carries for something like six metres, which is not, which is the last thing you need from your power lock. Like, it's literally the last thing. Um, Peter O'Mahony did not have a good game by his standards. I don't think he's in great form since the World Cup. That happens. Do you know? Ryan Baird and Jack Cohen then come in. They didn't have great performances by their standards. So like these things happen. These things that have to be looked at and worked on. And I think they will. And as you said as well, I would not be making wholesale changes. Do you know? I would be keeping it pretty much yeah. the same. See how Calvin is. See how Kieran Frawley is and go from there. And that's the height of it, to be they'll honest. Both, but They'll both have to go through... HIA protocols, yeah. yeah. I think the fact that we haven't heard Anthony now, you'd usually say, oh, that's a sign of X or Y, but I don't think it's that. I think it's the fact it's the last week. And one of the bugbears of mine is Ireland don't call up people to the training squad too often, even mm-hmm. if I don't personally agree with it a lot of the time. And I think that's just all it is, is they're just going to give them every chance and they're not going to just come out and say, oh, such players out, because they know, they know at this stage. It, yeah. HIA 2 is the big one, which is... 48 hours or 24 hours afterwards one or the other and like that's the big one that decides whether you're going to play or not so yeah anyways we will get Yeston's opinion because we like having an outside perspective on these things and again maybe maybe it's a good thing that we've once been on to get an outside perspective as you said wooden spoon week but yes I want to ask you first of all where do you think it went wrong for Ireland but also on the flip side of that where do you think England got it right I think it was just mainly down to the pressure that England's you know, give and especially in defence, you know, at the start of the tournament, everyone's questioning how long it's going to take this English defence to, to really click under Felix Jones, obviously a completely new system with, with Blitzen out. Um, and 
and and you can see that it slowly is starting to to work and work well. You know, there was obviously a, a, the odd moment at, at the start of the tournament against Italy where it didn't go to plan, and maybe against Wales it might might not have clicked, and Wales tried to do some 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 chip kicks and things like that. But you kind of see it that they kind of set out what they wanted to do to play against Ireland, and they they stuck to it for the entire eighty minutes. You know, there was a lot of talk during Calcutta. Calcutta Cup week about Freddie Stewart not being involved in the in the starting squad and George Furbank coming in, and okay, Furbank didn't have his best of days in Murrayfield on that particular Saturday afternoon, but I thought he played well on the weekend and he you can kind of see why both made that change in a way, and that's nothing against Freddie Stewart who I think is a really really good rugby player, and and they just they just attacked kind of smartly as well. There was nothing there was nothing majorly flashy of them, but. When when the opportunity came, they they did take it, and you know I thought Ford had a, all right. Ford didn't have the best of days off the kicking tee, but I thought he did a really good job in the attack in terms of just orchestrating that that team around. And you know when you got someone like Mara Torsi up front, who I thought had a quite a good game as well, and you know someone like Ben Earl as you mentioned about his his sprinting uh, towards the um, James Low exit kicks, but I think for Ireland they just couldn't really get anything going. And, you know, maybe that might have been part down to the to the blitz defence that England were imposing on them. But I think one stat I saw, which saw these one of the second rows that had made more passes than one of the centres. Which you yeah, think? That, I oh. think that that was the case. I didn't see it, but I, I've seen something alluding to the centres and passing, right? And, and you're thinking, you know, Bundiaki... And you know players like that who are you know normally so good and you know who normally get themselves involved and stuck in, even when maybe things might not be going to plan. But just felt like they they weren't getting not as much stuck in, but they just couldn't get themselves involved in a way due due to the English defence. And you know have to give a bit of credit to Jamison Gibson Park. Fair play to him to to step out on that wing, and I thought he was really good in that in in the final twenty or so minutes when he was out there. But I think there was a hint of game management which kind of fell away from Ireland as well. You know, yeah. it's small, a, bit, a small bit. It's a, it's a bit contagious, especially nowadays in, in rugby. When do you like stop kicking and stick it up the jumper and try and play and close out the last remaining minutes of a game? You know, Murray kicked, uh, put a box kick in at about two minutes to go. And you, you're thinking, that's borderline close in between the timings you need. If there's a minute to go, you probably just about have enough to stick it up the jumper and and see it out, barring any penalty decisions. But if it's a bit longer than that, you kind of think, well, like you can see why they're kicking to, to avoid staying in the particular area of the field, but you have to make sure the kick is pinpoint and 100% accurate and the chase is there as well. And I felt like that might have been the issue that Ireland had on the weekend. Yeah, no, I, it caused a lot of debate. I think the kick decision was right. I, I have no problem with that. He, the moment, fair enough, people might have an, a slight overreaction, but I think the decision was right. I think the bigger issue was in the next ensuing t- two phases, we basically have England back to where we kicked the ball from. And like, you can't let that happen in two phases. After like, I think it was like a 35 meter clearance kick to touch from a box kick. Like that's, that's as good as you're going to ask, especially on that short side. If the ball is on the far side of the field, we probably give it to James Lowe and he probably thumps it down. And, you know, if Kieran Frawley's still on the field, maybe he gets back there and takes on the responsibility because, like, to his credit, Jack Crowley isn't the biggest boot of a ball, very accurate, not the biggest kicker of a ball. And it's just, as you said, this kind of falling between two stools about it because, like, you, you can't for two minutes hold on to that ball when you're losing collisions. Because you're either going to get pinned for stealing off, someone's going to come in for the side, or England are going to win a turnover. And if you do hold on for, for two minutes, then you've deserved you've deserved it. But it's so hard, especially when you're trying to not play and not make yards. Um, so it is an awkward one. And I don't know. I just <laughs> I, you mentioned Ashley Gibson Park, and I, I should probably touch on that post game. I was quite critical of him. Watching it back, I think he did all right. There were mistakes. There were certain mistakes, and I, I've said this, this is kind of part of what you get with him. Kind of, kind of like DuPont and his solo runs and things like that when they go wrong. like You kind of just have to take it for what it is, but he did play well. 
he was one I was like I was pretty happy with the midfield from nine to thirteen. Bundy yeah, he kind of reminds me of an NFL running back in that game, the fact that he got every last inch out of it. Every last inch out of every last carry that he had, but he was running, running up blind alleys, and that was a major issue. And if I think to his credit, or to Jack Crowley's credit, even if it wasn't him at 10, I think it could have been worse for Ireland because the ability to problem solve while at the, the, the point of attack in the gain line is probably where he has a huge point of difference over all the different, all the other 10s. And it certainly made a difference for the second James Lowe try. But we'll move on to next weekend because I, again, I'm conscious of not being too doom and gloom. Because that's exactly why we bring on David. So we're we're not too doing him because he's always happy. Mm-hmm. And David, I'll come back to you because there is a championship to fight for next weekend. There is a championship to be won next weekend. I said it in a tweet over the weekend. I think that's the bare minimum now. I think that was always the bare minimum once they bet France. Or once they came into the championship, the minimum was you have to at least be fighting for a championship on the last day. And we are. And it's there for them. It's advantage Ireland. How important is it in your eyes that they get a proper bounce back in Dublin on Saturday? Oh, I think it's huge. I mean, it, it's, you know, the, the thing is, Ireland had such a good start to this tournament because we, you know, we went away to France. It was it was in Marseille. Very difficult to win over there. Um, you know, in, in if you go back to 2020, you know, we had a great a great championship that year, but it was that match, that, that, that away game to France that was kind of the decider. And I think going into that game, none of us fully appreciated just how psychically scarred France still were from that World Cup. Um, you know, you talk about Ireland having a having a tough time with quarterfinals, but for France, this is something they've been planning since since basically since they got the ho- got to host the tournament. You know, um, a lot of players would have been um, marking this out as kind of the seminal point in their careers, and I don't think they've adequately dealt with it and, and that definitely helped Ireland so I think once we got over that hump it just it seemed like well we have to go from here now you know there's, there's obviously we have England away and, and that went as badly as, as you would imagine it could have but but once we crossed that that barrier it, it felt like I agree we the championship was the minimum and I think particularly because not to do it on any of the other uh, teams in the tournament particularly not teams uh, f- from which we have representatives on the podcast today but <laughs> Beating, you know, that's a very young Welsh side. They had to come to Dublin to do an almost impossible task. Um, Italy have played very well this year, but at the same time, once again, in Dublin against a, an Ireland team that was just off the back of a big win in France. Those were good victories. But if if we don't bookend this with a win against Scotland, this this whole tournament takes on a completely different um, look. You know, we beat a France team that are at sixes and sevens and don't really know um, where they're at. We beat an Italian team, yeah, a very good Italian team, but we did beat them in Dublin, and we built, beat um, a very, very green Welsh team. Um, so if if we can't get the, I know I fully back the lads to do it, but if we can't get a win this weekend, it, it this tournament will have very quickly, like in the span of two weeks, have gone from um, an incredible backup of the twenty twenty three form to. Um, a real questioning of the the big game players, you know, the people like Kalen Dorst, the people like Bundyaki, the people like um I wouldn't say Crowley because he's he's obviously quite new and he's he's gone quite well, but people like James Lowe, people like um Ty Byrne, you know, the really big players in the team, Peter Romani, we need to back it up next week. We not just for the, the championship, but but for for the sake of the momentum of this team. Um, if we can't back it up at home against Scotland, it it will really, really bring into question whether or not we're capable of dealing with high stress, high high um, pressure situations. That being said, not to be doom and gloom, I do think we will do it. Um, I don't know how clean it'll be, but I, I I would fully back Ireland at home with a lot on the line, but with I would imagine a fully sold out crowd behind them. I I really can't see a way that this will go. Um, other than Danny and Ireland's favour. Um, I do think Scotland will show up for it. As I, I think I said to you earlier, they're they're chasing a, a triple crown for the first, it'd be the first time in, in quite a while. And um, obviously a big away win. Um, I think they'll be kicking themselves because if they got that win over Italy, you know, there's a there's a championship on there would have been a championship on the line for them too. Um but yeah, with that triple crown in in mind and, and with the idea of you know ruining Ireland's time. Ireland have had Scotland's measure over the last few years. They've had the misfortune of being drawn against us in the last two World Cup draws. 
and those games very much did not go in their favour. If they can get one over on us, I think they they do absolutely champion at the bit to do that. So, um, I think it'll be a an exciting game. Scotland are a team that like to attack. Ireland are a team that like to attack. I think we could see a lot of tries, but I do think in the end Ireland are going to come out on top. And again, it's just they have to. Like I don't care if they, they really three. have to. They do, and like this, even the South African tour takes an entirely different light if they don't, because then yeah. you've gone into the Six Nations doubling down and trying to win it, which. Yeah. Essentially, only two teams did. I mean, maybe, only a week, maybe only, three. Only a week ago, we had Sam Warburton saying he still thinks Ireland are the best team in the in the world. Now that might have been done just to annoy the South Africans, but you know, in two weeks, that's a massive sea change to go from possible first back to back Grand Slams, um, and on our way to challenge the world champions in their backyard. To, I mean, if we don't beat Scotland, it, it will be slinking out of the tournament with our tail between our legs, and I don't think that's a thing that this team is going to to leave up to chance. And they, they just can't. Like, it's it's as simple as that. They just can't. Or those serious questions should be asked. Serious questions that probably could have been asked last November if it was anyone other than New Zealand. Do you know? And, like, there is that factor that's like, well, it's, it's New Zealand. Like, there's always a chance they'll figure it out, and they did. Um, And, like, that's that's kind of the, the prison which view it point, view it from. But we are, what, like, 20 minutes into this show, so I should move on. Because uplifting... Picture the sunshine, picture of Rome, a packed out Stadio Olimpico because Gonzalo Caseda's men overturned a 12 point deficit to beat Scotland for the first time since 2015, their first home victory since 2013 in the Six Nations, which was actually against us, coincidentally. After the agony of Lille, it was sheer joy. Paolo Gavisi, the hero. Yeston, what a win for Italy, what a statement performance, and literally no more than they deserved. Well, first of all, um, I did have a little bit of a um, bit of a fright when I saw Gabi C. Well, when I saw the ball fall off Gabi C's tee at the first penalty, I thought, "Oh no, not again!" But he he kicked it, which is which is good. And then all of a sudden, Scotland just came into this game from from out of nowhere and scored a couple of really nice tries. And you're thinking, you just hope that the Italian heads didn't drop, you know. 22-10 down, you're thinking, you know, if Scotland get another score, it's it's going to be a long way to, to come back into it. But full credit to Italy coming back into it the way they did, you know, just making sure that the scoreboard was ticking along. And with um, Pedrillo and um, and Garbisi, you know, they had two fine kickers who could do that. And they they, they seem to um, have identified a good weakness in the Scottish backline, especially through kicking, as we saw with the first try with, uh, Ignacio Bres scoring, he you know the sc- King uh, King Horn at fullback has has gone to cover the wing, and it it leaves um, poor Horn trying to cover the entirety of the backfield, and um it, it was a neat uh, set play from from the Italians and and Brex scores from it, and then obviously the uh, Louis Liner try in the second half, is is another kick, so it's it's surely there was something that the Italians looked at. And the, probably the most pleasing thing was it was a win at home against a side that didn't really rest many players. You know, you, you probably got used to over the last few years, you know, teams playing Italy and maybe resting the odd player here and there. Um, but, but certainly over the last couple of years or so, OK, we'll exclude the World Cup, um, the last World Cup last year. But over the last couple of years, you know, there's definitely been improvements in this Italian side. You know, two years ago, they went in Cardiff, you know, and you just felt like they just need another win just to get back onto that train, especially after a poor World Cup. They were ridiculously close last week in France, and they they probably fully deserved it this this weekend in in Rome. And you know, full credit to them and um, Crusaders head coach. He, he seems like a really smart appointment. And and you know, they've got they've still got about the young squads. You know, garbisi has been around the block for for a good number of years. Well, for 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 four years and and you know they're still they're still growing by every game and you know I mentioned Brex and I got to give a bit of a mention to Tommaso Menoncello because I think he is probably been one of the one of the stars of the tournament and a well deserved victory for the Italians. Absolutely, Menoncello and Brex in particular were phenomenal. It's it's probably as good of a center pairing performance that we've seen in the tournament so far, and it kind of ties in at my point. The next point I was going to make, David, because we knew if Italy were to win this, and it was always kind of an if, 
it was going to go down to the wire and it did. But because of that, you have to give them so much credit for that incredible last gasp defensive stand. Like Michele Lamro met something like, was it 29 tackles or something on Saturday? He definitely had a few in that passage. The two, um, Lorenzo Canone had a couple of tackles in that passage. Giuliani, I'm pretty sure did. And the centers, as we said, Menicello and Brex, like, Talk about coming up clutch when needed for a team who hasn't been there, who hasn't done it. Yes, they bet it, they bet Wales, but apart from that, it's been meager for the last couple of years. They needed to be gutsy, they needed to be confident. No penalties allowed, no space for a drop goal, ends in a knock on. Like, it's in some ways, it is the perfect way for Italy to win that game because it's exactly what we've criticized them before. Yeah. No, it was, it was the thing about this game was was from an Italian perspective was it was a very complete performance. Italy have shown that they're capable of of um, scintillating attack in the past, but um, the kind of consistency you need to win a test match like that, the kind of defensive metal you need, has been something that has been has been lacking them, and it's and it's something that um, they've struggled with at club level as well. Um, you know, notably, I mean, you know, I'm a big Zebra fan and, and Zebra similarly, very good attacking team, can't defend for their lives. And so it always ends up costing them games because if you can't stop the other team scoring tries, you're going to end up in a, in a shooting match. And if, if they have any kind of defense at all, you're not going to be able to score them. This Italian performance was, it was complete. And I think the, the best thing for um, Italy out of this game is that they've had upset wins before, you know, they've, they they've gotten wins against big teams. Um, interesting little factor. I think there's only three teams that they've ever played against that they've lost against without beating. Two of them are New Zealand and England. The other is the Cook Islands. The fun fact for you. Um, but there's the there's the fact we all needed on this. There's a fun fact. Dreary Monday evening. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about this loss, there's this win for Italy is that it wasn't an upset. It didn't feel like it, they they blitz Scotland or that they'd taken them a surprise. This was a genuine, honest to god competitive test match and they came out on top against another serious side you know a side that had just come you know well, beat England. Well, well hang on now i think that's might be one of the issues we're going to talk about on scotland are they serious i think because... in the six i think in the six nations they are i think in the last few years you know obviously are ireland have had their measure but they've they've started to put consistency together you know that they've they've definitely had england's number for years they've been consistently finishing you know top three or or, or four um, so I no, I, I do think certainly when compared to to Italy's win record, this is this is a serious competitive win fixture, and they won, and they did it after an excellent performance against France, where they they probably should have won. And I think that's one thing. I think Casada himself said it is that Italy have struggled to back up; they've struggled to follow one strong performance with another one, and um, now they've done that. Uh, obviously they didn't it didn't go their way in Ireland but they came very close to they were like right on England's tail they had a bit of a an off patch in the second half in that game where it got away from them if they could have stamped that out they genuinely could have had a chance against England there they should have beaten France um they have now gotten the win over Scotland and they're going to be going to um it's in Cardiff next week isn't it yeah. they're going to go to Cardiff with a serious hope of a serious possibility of of getting another win there and saying it to, to our mutual friend Theo, they could come out of this tournament having a realistic chance of four out of five wins. And that that's incredible. Like even, even if they come out with two wins and a draw, for a team that, you know, only a few years ago, people were questioning their place in the Six Nations. This is a huge step up. And it's, like I said, they're not upsets. These are genuine wins where you can see they have good patches, they have bad patches, but they put a whole 80-minute performance together and they get the win in the end. And it's players, like you said, Ignacio Brex, and uh, Manicello were phenomenal. Manicello is only 21. This is a young Italian team. And if you look down uh, further down the tracks at their under 20s teams and how they've been performing over the years, I think there's a real chance that Italian rugby is going to be, start to become a much stronger force in the Six Nations, uh, possibly even a much stronger force in world rugby. And I, I think after years of, um, of, of, of slogging it out, of, of carrying that wooden spoon, it would be a great sign of of a real growth of, of what is still quite a minority sport into something that could become much bigger. Um, I had a friend who I worked with who's a Sicilian, never followed rugby at all, very much a devout uh, soccer man, but I, I tried to get into, into it in the last World Cup and he texted me immediately after that game, absolutely ecstatic. It's, it's If we can get people like that, people who had no interest in rugby, suddenly interested in it, 
because they have a team that realistically has a shot of winning. Um, I think that's that's the greater, bigger story. But on the on the the smaller story level, on the just the day, the day that's in it level, this was a fantastic win for Italy, and it was a great reward for their fans for selling out Stadio Olimpico for the first time in I don't know how long. Um, and and if they can back it up next week, we talked about how if Ireland can't back it up next week, it'll really change the temper of their tournament. But if Italy can back it up next week against Wales, it's going to go down as as one of their, if not their best tournament. Um, since the start of the Six Nations. No, and I, I do agree. And I should add, when I put in the line about Scotland, it was not questioning whether this counts as a big win for Italy. It does. It is It is huge. The fact that it came at home, I think, is massive. I think that's so much bigger than than just winning the game because they hadn't won a home in 11 years in the Six Nations. Yes, they won in Cardiff, and that was very, very important for them two years ago in the stepping stone. But to do it at home the eruption, the passion, the emotion. Like, when they have their November test there this year, there's going to be an added buzz. You know, and that's that's kind of the, the feed-on point. But to go back to Italy, because I do want... We'll talk about Scotland next during the week because we'll have a preview of the Ireland Scotland games. We'll get to talk about them. We'll talk about them in a minute as well. Like, so many players stood up. But it's players who are going to have to start learning the names of as well. Like... Nicolo Canone, I, I mentioned it, I text someone who um during the game, I was like, he's everywhere. He's just been everywhere. Now, the fact that himself and Lorenzo look fairly similar, similar size, similar build, you know, there's, there's that side of things as well. But they were, they were phenomenal. I think Federico Ruzza has had an amazing tournament. Lamro, who was mentioned, he's the top tackler in the tournament, I'm pretty sure. Or if not, he's right up there. I think Pajrello has completely changed their attack. No disrespect to Stephen Varney, but he is a he's a finicky kind of kind of nine. You know, he does make mistakes and he probably doesn't back it up. Pajarello has been phenomenal. Garbisi has been good, haven't had, you know, a lot thrown at him, including ourselves. Like we doubt him on this podcast earlier on in the tournament, but he's he's bounced back to centers we mentioned. I talk a Pozzo had a very assured game, which is probably something that, you know, again, we kind of doubt him because he's had his moments, but he's not had the run of games to mature at the level that Italy would probably want him to have, but he has matured. Monte Ioane, he carries with purpose. He carries with, he kind of carries the team a small bit. Like he's kind of, like he's almost like your, your big power forward in the fact that when he gets go forward, the team gets go forward properly. And it, it's huge, it's huge for Italy. And the fact that this is the first time, you know, four rounds in the three weeks they didn't play Ireland, they were last on the billing on this podcast. I'm sure we're not the only one to have bumped them up because it's the big storyline. It's the one they ever want to talk about. And listen, I don't I don't know about you. I was in the pub on Saturday and we all jumped up out of our seats when that ball was knocked on. Um, and that's not just because I'm a monster fan who doesn't like Glasgow. <laughs> it's not it's not that at all. But like it, it is it's a huge moment. It's great to see. But yes, no, I, I want to ask you about Scotland. Um, because they came into this game as genuine title contenders. And like, yeah, England did them a favor, they still have the slightest of chances. They could still win a triple, triple crown, as David said. But this is just such a misstep. Like, how are we supposed to take this team seriously when they don't show up in the World Cup against South Africa? They definitely don't show up against Ireland. They had three tries scored against Wales, couldn't get a fourth. Three tries scored against England, couldn't get a fourth. Three tries scored after 25 minutes here in this game, couldn't get it. Or two, sorry, three tries scored after 25 minutes, couldn't get a fourth to see off the game, do get a fourth when the game looks lost. Like, there, there has to be questions asked of Scotland at this stage, surely. Uh, well, I think there is. But before I go on about Scotland, for anyone that doubts Paolo Garbisi, I have him as my fancy captain. So um, <laughs> I, I never have. It's been some sort of tradition of mine for my fantasy team that I always stick him in as captain, regardless of form. But um, but yeah, it, it seems like a bit of a weird patch for Scotland because if you, you look at certain parts of their game, you think, oh, they're, they're a really good side, you know. First half against Wales, where they ran into a lead, and obviously Van der Merwe scored that try, giving them a twenty-seven the lead. The you know the hat trick that Van der Merwe scored against England. You're thinking, oh, right, Scotland might be onto something here, you know, and then you have these little lapses of of just either not concentration. I'm not really sure what it is, but it's quite hard to, to kind of pinpoint where it just, just feels like they have a little spell where it just doesn't really click. And it feels like it goes on longer than what you normally expect it to be as well. Cause obviously against Wales, 
You know, they scored that try in the 42nd minute and they were under the cost for the rest of the game. And and you're thinking and you're walking out thinking, oh, if Wales have another score, they'd have won and probably one of the biggest comebacks in in the history of the Six Nations. You know, okay, the France game is a completely different story for a completely different day, especially with the ending. But, you know, I'm not sure how much that kind of affected them in a way, because, you know, there's similar performance happened in Cardiff before where they, they built the lead, then they maybe didn't take a chance or failed to, to kill off the game. And then they, they, they allow the opposition back in. And it's a perfect case of it happening out in Rome on Saturday. You know, you score three tries and you're thinking, right, when's this bonus point going to come? And, you know, when when are Italian heads going to drop? But whilst the Italian heads didn't drop, it felt like the Scots did in a way. They thought, all right, well, we're not having it very easy anymore. And, and it just felt like the Finn Russell was was at times just on his own. I think I read a tweet saying that that whilst Scotland have lost their heads, Finn Russell hasn't, or, so, or words to that effect. And you're thinking, you know, there's something not potentially right there. And it's, it's really hard to pinpoint. And it's, it's a really big week for Greg, Greg Townsend now, you know, having the chance of genuinely winning the championship has now gone. Well, there's still... A slight, realistically, yeah, there's still a slight if you're mathematicians out there, but but it's just it's just the you know how do you lift up that side from you know the France game from the Italy game, you know failures to take bonus points in the other two, and you know to go to Dublin, which is a really tough place to go at the end of the day, so it's it's a big week for Scotland, and it'll be very interesting to see how they turn up on Saturday. Yeah, it is, and it's it's. I feel like you could write a book on Scotland just by nature of them. They are the new France. You don't know what's going to turn up, but I, I'm delighted you mentioned that point about Finn Russell because I was going to ask David if you hadn't. It does feel like he is the steady Eddie on that team, and it sounds remarkable. You wouldn't have even said this two years ago, but it feels like he's the constant. He's the one who's making things work. It's his crossfield kick to, I'm going to say, Carl Stain, um, that gets them the spark and gets them ahead I guess or get some goal forward in the last minute of the game. Otherwise, they were going nowhere. It did feel like for a lot of that game, he was just shoveling on ball. His red path and Hugh Jones, they had sparks, but they didn't do a lot. Blair Kinghorn didn't really do a lot in that second half to kind of push on, force the initiative. Felt like Doohan was running, running up blind alleys as well. And sometimes it is just a case of, well, especially for Finn, he's, he's not a huge ball carrier. He can only do so much. And Maybe it's a game plan thing. Maybe it's the pack build. Maybe that's wrong. You know, I thought Andy Christie actually had a good game, but is is he the type of player they're going to go for with a big heavy six? Is that the way they're going to go with Darge as your breakdown threat? I think they kind of have to. I think power is still an issue, even though, yeah, against France, it wasn't too big of a deal. Against England, it wasn't a big deal. Against Wales, it, it wasn't. But still, you come up against an Italy side who will always punch above their weight and Scotland just looked small and like mentally and physically in that second half and it's it is serious questions and you, you do have to say like seen a lot of complaints about um um Angus Gardner who was reffing it I thought to be honest neither side can have can have much complaints to be honest because both of them were kind of you know he was strict he, he just had a very strict day and listen ref ref discourse is not something we like to get into anyway but Italy roll on. They will play Wales next. We might touch touch that in a few minutes, but we have one last game of the men's championship to move on to because Wales took on France in Cardiff. This is our opening game next year, coincidentally, albeit in France. And to be fair, it didn't disappoint for about 60-odd minutes, but the strong Welsh effort was in vain. France were now 45-24 winners, as you may know, and as Yeston alluded to now, it looks like it is wooden spoon week for Wales. They need a mini miracle to avoid it. And Yeston... As, as our Welshman on the show, I'll start with you. Like four losses from four for Gatlin's Wales. We thought he stormed out of a press conference. He didn't. He just had other places to be. But like, it doesn't feel like it's a catastrophic failure. But just the nature of this one is just, it, it feels like it's going to sting. It feels like it's it's the one game that if they stayed in the fight for 80 minutes, they could have done something, but just ran out of steam. Yeah, it's probably a tough one to take for, for any Welsh reporter out there, you know, I think it's kind of been the theme of, of Wales's tournament in a way, 
is quite similar to Scotland, where they, well, obviously Scotland might might have patches of of poor play, but Wales kind of just sometimes maybe fall off in latter stages of matches or, or you know maybe maybe at the start of matches like we saw against Scotland in round one, but you know it's it's probably a better better pill to swallow. Um, you know, you know France wouldn't wouldn't as as you know France as a France of old as in from the 2019-23 World Cup cycle. But um you just you just kind of sense that you know the Welsh side gave it a really good go, but but the French bench, you know, they, they, they got on top and at the end of the day it's um you know you know with the power up front, you know, you got the likes of Antonio, uh Meafu the second row on debut looks looks big. And um uh, and yeah, you know, they just they just took they just they just, you know, slowly got their way forward and they, they took control and, and won the match. You know, Gregor Old Gregor Aldrich being back was a huge bonus for them. Um and you know, so I think with uh, an Antoine Dupont who might not be uh, obviously you're playing sevens, is um has been his role's been nicely filled by a certain Mr. Ligarec, who's who seems like a really good French come off, you know, in his first Six Nations start, you know, he had a good game as it was, and to pull that reverse pass out from from seemingly nowhere was pretty exceptional. But it's probably not a dig on wheels either. You know, there were some really encouraging performances. Um, okay, there was the odd mistake, but both centres went well. There was a lot of talk about that in the week. You know, George North and Nick Tompkins being dropped, but Owen Walking came in and played rather well. Probably one of his best games for Wales. Um, in, in at twelve, and Joe Roberts in his first Six Nations start gets a try. Although if he didn't score, there would be a lot of discussion about that, as he should have cast that out. But you know, you've got the likes of Raffle, Thomas Williams, who have played well throughout the tournament, and you know, in the first half, I thought the the the, the three second rows. So obviously, Dav Jenkins moved to six, and you had know, Adam Beard and Will Rowlands together. I thought they all worked. Worked rather well, despite what the French scrum were, were doing, but um, it, it feels like it's 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 quite hard to to pinpoint it on on the players. Okay, you know some tactical and substitution calls. You know people have disagreed with online because with Thomas Williams and Costello having a, an okay game, but it feels like it's a it's a it's a wooden spoon that the the players probably don't deserve as they've. You know, of course they might they might beat Italy and avoid it, but if it is the case, it doesn't feel like the players they, they probably don't deserve this. It's probably down to the to the decade or so where where the governing body, the WIA, have been an utter mess from, from top to bottom, especially with, with their ways of their their work with the, the professional clubs and it's probably one on them, not on the players and coaches. No, I get that. I might just touch on a point you made there because you touched on uh Thomas Williams and Sam Costello. I, I personally, I I think they've had a good championship. Not perfect. Don't get me wrong. Like it hasn't all went their way. Um, at halfback for Wales, what have you made of them overall? And in terms of just looking forward, and Cost Costello in particular, because there's been a lot of talk about him. A lot of it is unfair. It is his first championship. What have you have you made for of it? Um, yeah, it it's you know, you're always gonna get people that come out and say, "Oh, so and so should be dropped because he's not very good" and and things like that. But you know, and I'm gonna use a Toby Booth line here. You know, fly halves especially need time in the saddle, don't they? And you know, more game time you get at ten, the better for for any young player out there. You know, you've seen with Jack Crowley in Ireland, who's who's obviously got a bit probably got a little bit more experience than Costello in terms of URC matches and playing in big games. So it kind of made his step up to the test level a little bit easier in a way. But um but you know it's 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 tough on Costello because you know these high pressure environments and and things like that, you know, these you know big games, you know, these big European knockouts or URC knockouts, you know, they you kind of get prepared for for the next step up in a way. And obviously with the way that the Welsh rugby is currently being run, the, the four professional clubs aren't really getting that sort of luxury of getting to the last stages of Europe and, and things like that. You know, when you saw when Cardiff played Toulouse in December, you know, the Toulouse side was, was stacked with, with, 
with basically a test team at the end of the day. You know, Dupont was playing, Ramos was playing, and things like that. But you know, the, you, these Welsh players at the minute, the youngsters that are that are coming through into the regional setups, who have, like I said, been underfunded for a long period of time. It's just, it's just that they they don't have games where they can close it out and see it out, and you know maybe if they're a point or two down, they they get that that final score to get them over the line, and I think it's probably the accuracy was probably the difference between Costello and and Ramos, obviously the French outside half, um, you know one example where where Costello you know puts a really neat kick in in behind the the French defence, but. Sadly, it travelled a little bit too long and it bounces, well, it goes out on the full. And then Ramos, a couple of minutes later, puts in a kick in behind the Welsh defensive line and it bounces into touch. And you're thinking, you know, that was, you know, the difference. France had a line out where it was back for the kick. Wales have a defensive line out five metres out from their own trial line because of Ramos's smart play. And you just felt like, you know, that the experience is the difference. And it's quite similar to what the French players were on debut. You know, you've got the likes of Ligarek, you got Leo Barry as well on on debut. You know those players have had a lot of top fourteen experience. You know Barry's been in fine form for Stade Francais uh, throughout the year, and then you you look at the Welsh side. There's someone like Cam Winnett, who is a perfectly good player. You know, and has stepped up well this Six Nations, considering his his lack of experience. Now he, I'm pretty sure the the Scotland game was something like his fifteenth or sixteenth professional game of rugby in his career. Where you've got, you know, some players who might not have got into the test squad until now, you know, who've had a handful of, you know, loads of of club games and European matches to their boot, you know, and when that's only just starting off at the at the club level, let alone stepping up into the into the test match level. So it it, it was always gonna be, you know, pretty tough, but but yeah, it's 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 hope more than anything that they can, you know, build on on some aspects of this of the Six Nations, but but Costello, it, it's an interesting one because if you take him out, who's there to come in to fill fill that void? You know, Dan Big is retired. As much as it pains most Welsh supporters nowadays, he is in fact retired from international rugby. You know, Gareth Anscombe is is out injured. You know, there's still a bit of talk of him coming back into the fold with Gloucester next season. Um, so it's you know it's a, it's a tough one for Costello. It's probably learning the hard way a little bit, you know, going out to Dublin, going, well, he didn't play against England, but, you know, facing these big sides, you know, and you're not going to get much momentum up front and it's, it was always going to be tough, but, you know, it's just about gaining that development and experience and hopefully, you know, going back to the club game and then hopefully getting close results and then hopefully that will feed up back into the national side. Absolutely. David, we have touched on France as well because they did win this game. I know, yes, and earlier mentioned Nolan Garek, who was a phenomenal player of the match on the day. Do you think, <laughs> I feel like this is just too too much of a roller coaster question, but do you think are they back or is it just the upside, the upside of the swing? I don't know if it's, if it's, if we've gone far enough to say that they're back. Yes. Um, I think, I think, we have really well. I think to touch on Nolan Legarek, I, I, I mentioned this to somebody when I was watching the game, even in the first half when they were still behind. It really kind of uh, seemed from early on that that Legarek was was who they should have had at nine all along. Not nothing against Maxime Luku, obviously he had the the partnership with Jalabert, but um, Legarek just seemed like the kind of energy they needed in that space. Still frighteningly young, but much more the kind of the kind of energy and the kind of game control that that Dupont uh really guided that team with, so I would I would expect they'll they'll retain him um uh, until Dupont gets back, um, yeah I don't know I don't know if we can say they're back just yet I do think that they seem to have grown into the tournament I think they got blitzed at the gate by Ireland uh I think they they haven't exercised exercised the demons of the World Cup just yet but as this tournament goes on and the longer they spend it in camp. Um, the more they they'll they'll get back into the flow of of just playing, uh, the matches in front of in front of them rather than replaying the ones behind them, um, you know they had they had the draw against Italy which probably should have been a loss but much as with with England and and Scotland if you go back and watch France and Italy over the years even though Italy haven't got wins they have seemed to be one of the teams even when France are our own form that are able to um 
able to get it get a get a good performance against France. So I wouldn't even hold that that almost loss that draw against them. Um, I I think they're I think they're growing into the tournament. I think that they, you know, week one, would if they had to play any team week one, they they probably would have lost. But as the tournament has gone on, they've gotten losses, they've gotten wins. They're just shaking it off now. They're doing what they should have done in in the immediate aftermath of the World Cup. You know, I think Ireland sent all of their players on holidays immediately after the World Cup. All of the French lads got right back into the top 14. And I think that's about the worst thing they could have done. Gregory Aldry took off until the new year. And he was probably, that was probably the smartest thing to do. But I think now with four games under their belts, they're they're a little bit back. They've they know what it is to win, they know what it is to lose, and they're they're getting back into the flow of, of rugby. And I think uh, a final weekend showdown with England where technically speaking, both teams can still win the tournament. Although obviously at that point, they'll know based on Ireland's result against Scotland, but they could be looking into a game there where both of them theoretically could still win the championship. Um, So I think at home, that one will really light a fire under France. Um, The thing with this French team is that it's a quality team. It's, you know, across the park. They're, they are a phenomenal outfit. The fact that they weren't playing uh, phenomenal rugby doesn't take away from the quality of the actual players. And I, I think now that they have Legorak in there, now that they they have a bit of a bit of impetus, which certainly in that last 20 minutes we saw what they're capable of when they when they actually set out to play. Gail Fico, I thought, had a had a brilliant match and he's a he's a big leader in that team too. So um are they back? They're not they're not where they were, but I don't think they'll I don't think it's necessarily fair to expect them to ever be there again because that that home World Cup was was the kind of um, top of the mountain target that 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 really only comes around once in a career, but they're definitely. I will say, if we had to play them again next week, I wouldn't be anywhere near as confident. Um, uh, despite how how well we went against them in the first week. Yeah, no, I I'd agree with that, and it's I think Bernard Jackman made the point as well. Like, we don't. I don't think we fully appreciate just how much resource was put into this France World Cup, like including paying top 14 wages for assistant coaches at national level, which just doesn't usually happen. Do you know, like that's kind of, they had to put a huge financial impetus. They had to get the best coaches. They had to get the best prep. You know, it was all like, it's since 2017, essentially. It's, it's a long time now and it was going to take a bit of time. And to be fair, it's sometimes the guys who don't have the baggage. Like you look at Francois Crow, arguably their player of the tournament, Nola Ligarek, mm. phenomenal. Um, the other day, Louis Bielbiari, who to his credit kind of came in and, and took that shirt, a starting shirt at the World Cup, but he's still young. And maybe it's just that naivety of youth. He's been one of their best players as well. And yeah, there's no real surprise to that. Yeah, yes, to, yeah no, go on, David. No, I think I think that's I think you actually touched on a really good point there. We made this point a while ago about Ireland that you had players like Dan Sheen and Hugo Keenan who didn't know what it was like to lose against the All Blacks. And so it was easier for them to play them. I think, yeah, more younger players like that who don't have the baggage. I mean, Antoine Dupont was so shattered by the loss. He's he's off playing sevens, which is great. And he's really good at it, unsurprisingly. But And he's beating you know, Ireland out of two weeks in a row. Of course, he has to find a way to ruin the party. But like, you know, you look a year ago in the run up to that World Cup, he was hanging out with, with the president, you know, with Emmanuel Macron. Like this was so big in France's... Um, uh, sports, um, so like this would have been a this would have been a defining moment for French sport if they got if they'd won a home World Cup, um, like, yeah, I think you're right. You cannot comprehend just how much was put into this, this endeavor, and for them to bow out in the quarterfinals, no less, um, I think was a massive like psychic um, um, blow. So yeah, I think younger players, players who aren't who didn't carry that, you know. Legorak is in now. He can make this his tournament. You know, the World Cup wasn't his event. He can make this now his event, um, his championship. So yeah, I, th- I think I think that kind of impetus is 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 exactly the thing. And that's the thing with France. The 14, 14, well, fourteen pro teams, the top fourteen, not to mention the pro D two. They have the cattle. You know, they could probably replace their entire squad, their entire twenty three next week, and still have a phenomenal squad. So yeah, I think a few uh wouldn't be the worst idea in the world to get a few young lads who who weren't in the World Cup and don't have the 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 bur- the baggage of that and uh and take a real good cut off England. I guarantee the one thing that would have changed if the only thing that changed over the weekend was the result in the Ireland game, you'd have changed that to the sentence too. 
they could change the whole 23 and still beat England. But unfortunately, we can't say that now after everything that's happened. But grudgingly admit that England are, are good at rugby. No, no, not going to happen. I think Roger was right. I do still think the Premiership is in dire straits. And he has every right to point that out. He has hammered every top Premiership team. But anyways, that's going off track and going down a tangent. Yes, and I'm going to come back to you for the final question for the for the senior championship side of things. We like to end looking forward. France welcomed England to Lyon. That's at 8 p.m. on Saturday night. Wales take on Italy and Cardiff next as well. That's the early game, the 2.15 game. Both sides need to win. Probably more importantly, both head coaches need to win. From what you have seen, how do you think round five will go in those two games? Um, I haven't made my mind up in terms of predicting Wales versus Italy yet. So if we can come back about Friday, uh, I'd give you a bit of an answer. Um, you know, like you just said, you know, Wales do need a win and they could find themselves in a place where they win and still get the wooden spoon. You know, I think the most important thing for Wales here is they avoid a, a complete white loss. You know, you don't want to play five, lost five on, on a Six Nations table. And, you know, it's really important that they, they try and stay in the fight with whatever means, if, if it's up front, or that, you know, using the backs or, or, or tactical kick in, you know, just stay in that fight. And, you know, who knows? There's, you know, but but Italy are going to come here with so much more confidence. I, I even think even if they lost against Scotland on the weekend, they'd still have quite a bit of confidence coming into this game because of what they did two years ago. You know, not many people expected them to come to Cardiff two years ago and win, and they came to Cardiff and they won. So, especially off the back of two really good performances and what they did last time in Cardiff, their their confidence, you know, should be up and it's. It's going to be a big task for Wales to try and stop that. So, I, my head, my heart says Wales, but my head really is thinking a, a narrow Italian win. So, I, I, I'm gonna have to call it a draw, but I think it'll probably be prob. I'm probably edging towards Italy by about a score, and just, and it's going, it's going to be a really good. It's going to be a good game, and it's going to be really you know an exciting game. Both sides probably will attempt to play in some way, shape, or form, and then. Obviously, France, England in the night. You just, you just feel like maybe France might have got that back on track. But then, if you watched England on the weekend, you, you're thinking, oh, they might go up to Paris, well, not but to France rather, and and be a lot more confident in their game. You know, especially in defence. So, I'm not, I'm not so sure on this one either. But, um, but it's a bit early to do predictions on a Monday night, if if I'm honest. But um. But yeah, it's it you know this one's going to be probably a bit of a difference in terms of contrast from Wales. I think it'll be a little bit more tight. I think you know I think France might might rely on the the tactical kicking aspects of things a little bit more, and I think the home advantage might just see them through. But I think it'll be another close match. I think England might just fall short on this one. So Italy by a score and France by a score. David, I might just get a quick word from you on those two games as well. Uh, yeah, well, like I said, with with France, I think they've been built into this tournament and they've been getting better. I think they'll go with Ligger again next week. Um, while I do think he's a very good uh, backup to Dupont and, and probably should have been a nine shirt, I also uh, think they're going to feel the loss of Jalibert. Uh, Thomas Ramos is a very good uh, test 15. I don't know if he's a very good test 10, but with Ligger running the show from nine, that might make up for that. I also think there's a possibility that England really peaked last week. Um, emotionally, you could see how, particularly Ben Earl, I mean, he's, he's one of my now favourite players in the England squad because he got so much uh, stick for the celebrating the knock-ons and uh, then he then he turns around and is actually a, a really good rugby player. But you could see how up for the game lads like him were and, and how much they they really, really went out there to just, just do a number on Ireland. And, and now that they pull that off, to go away to France next week I don't know if they'll have the emotional energy to back it up and I think France uh, now have maybe a point to prove after how some of the other results in this tournament have gone so I'd say France will edge it uh, with the home advantage although it, it wouldn't be beyond England to give them a bit of a scare uh, when it comes to Italy Wales I mean I'd love to see Italy go down there and 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 back up the performance that they had in Scotland like I said they 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 have struggled to back up performances, but haven't put the the draw that should have been a win against France 
and back that up with a win against Scotland at home. It'd be great to see them do three in a row. Um, I'll touch on something that actually I think Michaela Lamro himself commented on last year after that great win in in Cardiff in 2022. 23 comes around and it's a home game and Italy are really setting up. This is kind of the game they're targeting and they lost their nerve and they they mentally did not prepare. I think they went into that game too focused on, weirdly, it's weird to say, but too focused on winning it rather than on playing it. And it got away from them and, and Wales did a job of them. Uh, I, you would hope that after that they will have learned from that experience and they certainly seem to have um seem to be a team now that are that are just able to play without worrying about the the too many of the overarching vibes it definitely would have been something i think ireland players have said that when you're in the match it doesn't matter what the predictions are it doesn't matter what the the overall goal is you have to win the moments you have to win the collisions if italy can do that i think that that there are odds on to win for me but it'll be it'll be narrow, and I think Wales, um, those young lads have had a have had a hell of a, t- a trial by fire in this tournament. But I think there is already some cream rising, and um, they will be very determined not to be stuck with the wooden spoon, particularly at home. So I'd say, it, uh, probably Italy by a score, but man, it'll be if it'll be a be a really narrow score. I I tend to agree. I don't like betting against Wales, um, especially in Cardiff, no matter who they play. Definitely not going to bet against France in Lyon. Like the ticket applications for that game was like three times the size of the stadium. Like it's going to be raucous. It's at eight o'clock at night. It's against England. Like it's the crunch. They might still have something to play for. Yeah, probably won't. But like I think at that stage at night, you really don't care. <laughs> um, just that side of it as well. I don't think I don't think the French need to have something to play for when it comes to England. You know that's no. that's enough. No, that's it. Like and two years ago when they won the Grand Slam for this game, it was kind of over after half an hour and it was a bit of a party. And that's the like they'll embrace it, and I think it'll be a cracking atmosphere. There's only one more game to cover. It's to the wreck in Bath, where under twenties league league sorry under twenties table leaders England took on defending champions Ireland. And boy, did it deliver. <laughs> Unfortunately, in some regards, we too many heart attacks this week. Ireland snatch a late throw with the last kick of the game after a try from Shannon RFC's Luke Murphy. David, I, I don't get into too much detail in the under-20s on this show, just kind of surface-level stuff, but like, what a game. What a championship it's been this year. Like Every game seems to be a cracker, and I suppose in terms of the on-field action, a draw probably the fair result. Yeah, I think so. I was watching it back today. Um, I also hadn't anticipated having to talk about this game. I did watch it live, but uh, but probably not with enough of a close eye to to be commenting on it. So I I watched uh, I watched the highlight reel back today, and watching the start of it, I was wondering, I was like, how did we almost lose this game? Because we were playing so well and and scoring some great tries, but um, England at under twenties level are and they have been for years. To be fair, now they they've spoiled our party a couple of times um over the years at under twenties level, um. But yeah, it was it was it was a hell of a fight. the The wreck is 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 a bit of crack of the ground, and 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 the two teams just absolutely went for it. It was, yeah, it was probably a fair result in the end to have it end a draw. And um, as much as we didn't get the win, it did it did kind of feel like a snatch. It as much as it would have been a snatch if, if the seniors had won. Um, England got that final score, I think, in the seventy seventh minute, and you got to feel for them because you feel you got seven points ahead with two minutes to go. You know, with the game a, is yours. Touchline to conversion to boot as well. What a kick. It's, yeah, brilliant stuff. I think it's Sean Kerr, their kicker, you know, very good off the tee. Um, you know, it's your game to lose at that stage. But but for Ireland to to really uh dig back in and, and get back to the goal line, and it can be so easy to 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 get a bit of whitewash fever, particularly when you're under under 20s, you know, these are young guys. It's always important to remember, you know, a lot of these lads are teenagers, they're they're not professional rugby players. Um, not all of them will become professional rugby players. For some of them, this will be the defining moment of their of their rugby careers, and to 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 show them metal, not to give away penalties, to keep their nerve, and to get that try right on the posts uh, to to secure the draw was phenomenal. There were um, a couple of you know you're always looking at, at at players as as potential. I think the the biggest one going into it, and probably one of the biggest one coming out of it, was Hugh Gavin, the, the big uh, number twelve. He's a phenomenal player. Um, you you feel he's definitely got a future at Connacht. It's it's something Connacht seem to have seems seem to go through these cycles. You know, Leinster have an abundance of out halves at the moment. Um, 
Ulster are, are renowned for their producing outside backs, but Connacht seem to be just producing centres at at a, at a at a pace. And I think when Gavin gets up to senior level, which I think he will, himself and Colin Ford could make a hell of a pairing. You know, even if you go back to, of course, Robbie Henshaw, probably uh, one of their greatest uh, products in the centre as well. So I thought Hugh Gavin was a big takeaway from that. Uh, Finn Tracy, I didn't know much about him before the game, to be honest, but man, that guy's quick. He's big, he's fast, but he's, he's fast. And, uh, you know, his, his try off that crossfield kick, Still had a man to beat, and he just muscled his way by him and, and dotted it under down under the sticks. He was phenomenal, and I thought uh, Murphy is it Jack Murphy? The is that his first name? Jack, Jack is the out half. Luke is number eight. Yeah, Jack Murphy, the the young number ten. I think he's, he's Richie's son, isn't he? Um, yeah. Watching the game back, he kicked well, but one thing I thought he was Ireland did a really good job of drawing England's defense in narrow, really condensing that defensive spread, and then. One pass out to 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 Murphy at, at ten, and he was whipping these big long passes left and right, and and the wingers were just sauntering in. And uh, I thought the that that kind of passing from some of that young in both directions was 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 pretty pretty impressive. Um, once again, there's a there's a long list of players coming out at Leinster. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if you saw him go to go to another province potentially. But I, I thought he really, as a number ten, controlled the game well and. And I think he had at least two, if not three, try assists directly off of his big long locking passes. So I, I thought as a standout, he was he was pretty good. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And I, I was going to touch on the players that kind of stood out because I feel like with under twenties, you can kind of go down the rabbit hole of X player came out of X school, he won this senior cup, and this is the guy to look out for. But like I don't know, just like it's in some ways it's a weird team because you look at Finn Tracy and, and Jack Murphy who you mentioned they're both out of Bray which is not a very established rugby school and, and Tracy there was some question marks about him from those who'd watched schools rugby question whether you know he was deserving of a starting spot I, th- I think even that question lingered up until this weekend until played really well top Ben O'Connor at full back you can see why Munster weighed him so highly yeah he's not perfect like it's under 20s mm. rugby no one is but there is the physical components there and there's a brain there. Well, he had a really nice, there was a, I think it was another one of Murphy's passes where he passes it out to Ben O'Connor, draws yeah. the final wing and then just throws in a one-handed offload. Yeah he, yeah, he was another one to mention. He, was, he had a pretty good game too. Yeah, and like with someone like Mike Prendergast coaching him, it's very exciting as a Munster, as a Munster fan. I thought Evan O'Connell, it, it, he's probably been skipped over. Maybe it's because he's in his second year, but like I think if a second row is standing out at this level and they're captain... And they just look head and shoulders, one of the best players in the field. It's, it's something to say for because there's a lot of talk about Junior uh, uh, Junior Kapoku, um, brother, I think he's brother of Joe Kapoku, if I'm right. Um, in the English second row, I thought Evan O'Connell was fantastic. I think he two line out steals, he was brilliant on the ground. Again, another one. And um, I thought Joe Hopes was really good as well at, at number six. And that's to go alongside the guys that you mentioned, you know, the likes of Hugh Gavin, who's who's been mentioned. Thought Luke Murphy stepped up in a big way in this game. I thought Danny Sheehan stepped up in a big way in this game. And like someone mentioned it last year, I think it could be Bernard Jackman or someone. Like the physical dominance of these Irish sides at under twenty level, like just purely on physical attributes, is something we've never seen before. And it, it's it's a sign that I think across the board the RFU have got it right in terms of conditioning of players at eighteen, nineteen, fresh out of school, sub academy or NTS or PTS guys as they're called. They've got it right this time and it's working and it's and it's really, really impressive. And there's still a championship there for them as well. And yep. the only difference is they're going to have to hang out about a half an hour, three quarters of an hour to see if they'll have done enough. It's just hammer Scotland and hope for the best. I know that France, I don't know if you've seen this. And if anyone is still listening to, to, to hear this, France have called up some of their top 14 players for this game, for the England game. So mm. if you ever want to talk about France, wanting to spoil an English party. They can still <laughs> win it themselves. But yeah. to spoil an English party, well, well, there you go, because there's a huge opportunity for them to do it there. And I think Hugo Royce, I think someone said it, one of them, the La Rochelle out half, like a lad who's who's played top 14 rugby for La Rochelle, the best team in Europe, at out half, I think he might be all right. The only difference is maybe they, are, they have minus cohesion by the time they take to the field on Friday night and it'll actually affect Ireland in the long run. But lads, we'll leave it at that. We've had a good hour and a bit talking about the Six Nations. 
Just one more week to go. Are we going to have two championships? Are we going to have double heartbreak on St. Patrick's weekend? God damn it, it better not be the second one. I really hope not. Otherwise, I'll still turn up, but I will not be a happy camper next week. But my thanks to Yeston and to David uh, for coming on. Slightly on short notice with tech issues and rescheduling and, and all the likes. It happens. It was bound to happen at some stage. So thanks very much, lads. Brilliant contribution as always as well. And as, as always, we'll be back. Previews, reviews of the round five action before switching our attention to the women's six stations where we have two feature interviews and two, one state of the game and one preview podcast to come on the women's game in Ireland. So stay tuned for that. But as always, thanks to everyone at home for listening. Thanks to the lads for their brilliant contributions. If you like what you see or hear, please do subscribe, leave a review, tell a friend. It all makes a huge difference. And I'll have all the links, all the relevant links down below. But for now, until next time, until Thursday, 